Hello, everyone. So this is my dream coming to I'm going to be reading through my first book called I Was Framed, Signed God. So what is that all about? I believe that there's just a lot of things that are going on in the world that really get attributed to God's doing when I believe the Bible specifically lays out that there may be other factors involved. And so this book is written for that purpose. And am I God's lawyer? Absolutely. So if you're asking me who's God's lawyer, you can look at my number. I'll go to the trials and I'll, I'll do it. It's called the God on Trial series. And what I wanted to do is for people who I don't necessarily don't like to read or don't have the time to read, but they have plenty of time to listen, riding the car, doing the whatever work, washing the dishes. So I just want, I'm going to read through the book and then I'll just be pausing from time to time and maybe add some thoughts and maybe there'll be times I'll repeat what I've written in the book and I didn't notice I said it. That's all right. That means it'll be a uh, reinforcement. And so I'm going to jump right into it. I'm going to read the introduction because that'll give you some framework to how, how I was thinking about what when I wrote the book. So here we go. Have you ever blamed God for gravity? And you're like, I can recall tripping while playing a basketball game and falling to the ground, spraining my wrist. And I thought, why didn't God keep me from hurting my wrist? How about the time I knocked over my drink over some very important papers? God knew that those papers were important. Why didn't he let the drink fall? Why did he do that? I know this sounds ridiculous, but subconsciously we wonder things like this. So here's a scripture that changed my life. And so Mark 6, verses 4, 6 through 6a, this is from the New King James Version. It says, but Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his own country, among his own relatives, and in his own house. And it says, now he could do no mighty work there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and he healed them and he marveled because of their unbelief. The Young's literal translation reads that he was not able. So God wanted to do something, but he was not able. So God could not do what he wanted to do. I thought, whoa, well, why not? I know you have to be intrigued. So this is one of the core questions that this series attempts to answer. So I know that this is a, can be a troubling scripture, especially for someone like myself who had the privilege of being taught through great teachers, doctors of theology, read through systematic theology. And we all know that obviously God is omnipotent. God is all powerful. And I hear you and the others go, yes, exactly right, Doug. He's all powerful. But then why would he say he could not when we know his abilities say he can do everything? So I don't believe God is saying he somehow lost his power. I don't believe that's it at all. And, I, and I, that's what this book is going to be, explain. What does he mean by he could not? Because we know of his abilities. And so we're just going to go. Hang in there with me. So as a lay minister, associate pastor, and a counselor, I found that a person's view of God affects how they interact with others, understand God as Father, and how they view themselves. This is crucial. It affects how they view the world, other Christians, and non-Christians. And I'm convinced that the level of joy, faith, and happiness in our lives is connected to how we view God and how we think God views us. So this is this is huge. We'll, this, this will be a recurring theme. So I love Bible study and I love studying theology. However, I did notice in many of my theological discussions with others that we had a very different view of what God was like. Have you ever run into that? I know you said yes. We would take the same scripture or scriptures and come away with two different points of view. So frustrating. 
I will admit this was frustrating for me, and in my mind, there was no way that I could see God wanting people to arrive at varying conclusions about his nature. And in my opinion, too much weighs in the balance to be content with having varying conclusions. So, so what's the challenge? So the challenge is this. I pray that the church just wouldn't, and this is the whole church body from all denominations, all whatever, would not just say, okay, well, you believe that, you believe this, and just to settle it. I think that would be a time. I think God wants us on the same page. I know he wants us unified. I know he wants us going in the same direction. And to have these disputes, we we all know they're fractions because of these type of, uh, this scripture means this to me, this scripture means that to me, so I'm going to be of this. I'm going to be of that. That's the whole, when Paul would say, you say, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Paul, and that just created division, and Paul did not want that. I don't want it. And so, if there is a chance that we can even get a handful of scripture say, I agree on that, and we've gone from disagreeing to agreeing, it's worth all the time. So, are you ready? Chapter 1. Search out a matter. I love discovering and learning. However, I love solving mysteries most of all. King Solomon said, It is the glory of God to hide a matter and the glory of a king to search it out. That's Proverbs 25, 2. And I hope you enjoy searching the scriptures. Jesus said that it has been given to us to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. That's awesome. So when I watch TV shows or movies that are mysteries, I try to solve them before it gets to the end. Needless to say, I'm a great fan of Sherlock Holmes. Thank you to my daughter for giving me that whole book anthology, Sherlock Holmes. So years ago, I began to reread the scriptures as if I were a detective. And I believe God wanted me to reread them as if I'd never read the Bible. Now, this method would challenge all of my preconceived notions and thoughts. I was to take a fresh look. I did, and I believe I have truly found the heart of God. As a result, I have written a series on the nature of God, and I plan to write other topics or books as well. And I call my new literary ministry the Great Detective Bible Topics. So on a practical level, every detective has a kit for investigating, and there are some tools you can use. Now, I use a Bible with a reference chart for each scripture. I also use the Vines Expository Dictionary of Greek and Hebrew Words and a good Hebrew Greek Dictionary. I think all those, there's the Blue Letter Bible, all those things are just very helpful sources. Now, if you have access to a computer, you can use a website called the Bible Gateway as well. And what is cool about these websites is that you can look at several biblical versions at the same time. And so, there are other apps out there that do the same thing. So studying multiple versions can help you understand the gist of a verse. And I've used the New King James Version unless otherwise stated. So the Bible is a collection of 66 books and the first 39 books are called the Old Testament and the remaining 27 are called the New Testament. The Old Testament manuscripts were originally written in the Hebrew language and the New Testament was written in the Greek language. So certain portions of the Bible were also written in Aramaic, which was primarily used by the common people. Now, I know that can be boring, but this is for people who are new to faith, who don't necessarily do Bible studies, and just not their practice. So for those of you all who know that, keep in mind. Let me give you an example of how I investigate. So Revelations 21.1, 21, 1, 21 verse 1 discusses that one day there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. So there's a key word search where I put that in that exact phrase, new heaven and new earth. And there were four passages of scripture that came up for the key word search. That was Isaiah 65, 17, Isaiah 66, 2, 2 Peter 3, 13, and of course, Revelation 22, 1. Now, I can begin my Bible study around that phrase in other verses. So I read the whole chapters of each of those passages. So I just didn't do the one verse in Isaiah 65, 17. I read all of Isaiah 65, 17 so I could get the context. So I can have a broader perspective. Now, remember, we're solving a mystery. 
So we're going to gather clues as we go along. So there will be some conclusions we can make on some points, but we'll have to be patient and wait until the end and watch all the pieces of the puzzle come together. So let the Holy Spirit guide you and teach you because that's his job and he's great at it. So John 14, 26 says that the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. He will teach you all things. And then he will bring to your remembrance all things that he said to you. John 16, 13 says, However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. So he will tell you things to come. So what I don't have written in there is I, I hope you can catch. God wants you to know about all of him. He wants to teach you all things. He wants to guide you into all truth. And then he's going to bring all those things that he's taught you. He's going to bring it to your remembrance whenever you need it. So don't worry about it. But that speaks to what God is like. He's not withholding truth from us. But it is a guiding into all truth. So anyway, we'll go on. So let's begin. I'm going to start at the end of biblical history, progress to our current time, and then we will work our way backwards to Genesis. So fasten your seatbelts. I do believe that you can certainly come up with strange theologies and, and philosophies based on one or two scriptures. I also believe there are common patterns and myriads of scriptures that describe God's heart towards man and his nature in general. So I will not include every scripture, but the ones I believe are very crucial. So one key scripture is Psalm 119, verse 60. And it reads, the entirety of the word of God is truth. The whole entirety is truth. And then another key scripture is Psalm 11, verse 3. If the foundations be destroyed, God asks the question, what can the righteous do? If your foundations are not solid. So I believe that a faulty foundation in our thinking about God and who he is and what he is like will cause the interpretation of scripture to become skewed no matter how good it sounds. So my goal is to bring about foundational teaching through key scriptures. And some key scriptures may seem obscure, but when connected with other scriptures, I believe we will begin to get a fuller and clearer picture of the heart and nature of God. So I will bring our investigation I'll begin our investigation by looking at our present crime scene. So the crime scene is planet Earth. There's death. There's destruction. There's poverty. There's crime. There's all sorts of heartache. Families are torn apart. Children are starving. There's tornadoes, hurricanes, tsunamis, earthquakes, floods. There's scandals, liars, cheats, abusers all around. We don't trust politicians, businessmen, police force, sadly, the church. So what happened to this world? So picture this crime scene. If you were to interview the witnesses and onlookers in order to find the prime suspect, most would shout out, God did it! God's will! He wanted it! If he could have stopped it, he would have done it. It's powerful. Blah, 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 blah. You know where I'm headed. So the prime suspect is God. So I say, God did it? Really? So here are some of the statements that I've heard some people say. The tornado was an act of God. The tsunami was a judgment from God. That person who died of disease was called home by God to be with him for some reason. God is allowing crime and poverty to bring us back to him. God brings all suffering into our lives to keep us humble and to teach us lessons and to bring him glory. I know I'm being facetious and being dramatic, but anyway, that's you hear these frequently. I know you do. Don't tell me you don't. And if you didn't hear it, you're thinking it yourself. All right, anyway, back to my book. As a detective, we must examine the accused. 
The accused in this case is God. And the reason that the responses above lead us to God as the bringer of tragedies is due to two core attributes of God, one of which we've talked about. God is all-powerful. And the biblical term used is omnipotent. The second key attribute that God is all-knowing, and the biblical term for that is omniscience. So if God is all-powerful, then certainly he had the ability to stop all tragedies, in quotes, if he wants to. The second reasonable conclusion is that if God is all-knowing, meaning he knows all the decisions that all created beings and humans will make before they make them, then he can certainly intervene any tragedy that would have a chance to be attempted. Again, these are reasonable thoughts based on the definitions alone that God actually says about himself. However, I would like to point out that throughout Scripture, it appears that sometimes God holds back his power and I will put for some reason. It also appears that based on his words, God is unaware of some things. That is very intriguing to me. For instance, we already reviewed two scriptures where Jesus says that Jesus and his Father are one, meaning Jesus views himself one with God. And then we see where Jesus said that he wants to heal people but was not able to do so. So do you see how this can be confusing? First of all, if Jesus knew he was going to a place where he couldn't do something, why did he go there? And if he decided to go, then why attempt to do something he knew he couldn't do? It's like a dumb on it, right? That begs the question, did he really know ahead of time or only at the point when he attempted to do it? That actually makes more sense. Secondly, are you God or not? If you're God, aren't you always all-powerful? There can't be any restraints on an all-powerful being, right? Just do what you want to do and move on. Chop, chop, God! Please don't think lightning bolts. I'm just kidding. God knows I'm kidding. Obviously, I'm setting you up for a great adventure. Here are some scriptures that will cause us to ask more questions as to how God views death. Death is the core topic that impacts everyone on a deep level. Suffering can be understood in our world, but sometimes death is what causes us to really question God's heart. So let's read these verses. 1 Corinthians 15, 25 and 26 says, For he must reign, talk about Jesus, till he has put all enemies under his feet. That last enemy that will be destroyed is death. Ezekiel 18.32 For I have no pleasure in the death of one who dies, says the Lord God. Therefore, turn and live. Ezekiel 33.11 Say to them, as I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. God calls death an enemy. How can this be possible for an all-powerful God to have an enemy? Secondly, God calls death. So secondly, <laughs> do you see it? If death is God's enemy, then it can't be his intention to cause death. However, as I mentioned earlier, most Christians believe that most, if not all, deaths are God-ordained because he is all-powerful and who can resist God's will. Let's review some of these scriptures that gave us this impression. That would be Psalms 116, verse 15. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. 1 Corinthians 5, 8. We are confident, yes, well pleased rather, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. And Hebrews 9, 27. And as it is appointed for men to die once. So from these scriptures, you can hopefully see that where a person might get the impression that dying is something that's beneficial. God calls the death of his saints precious. Therefore, it must be good, correct? And if we are absent from the body because of death, then we get to present, be present with the Lord. And that has to be good as well. So lastly, if there is an appointed time for us to die, 
so that when we die, that must be the time since God is all powerful and all knowing. A plus B equals C, D, F, G, H, I, J, K, L. Anyway, however, we can see from Old Testament prophets, Jesus and his disciples, that raising people from the dead back to life was common. So not everybody died once. So it must not have been the time or else Jesus wouldn't have raised people from the dead. So the question is, how did they know that they could even pray such a thing. Think about that. If you believe that all death is from God, why, why would it even come into their mind? Oh, let's just go raise that widow's son from the dead. Elijah did it. Elisha did it. In the Old Testament. So this leads me to believe that there must be some deaths that can occur, but is not the person's appointed time. So this is where Psalm 119, 160, that scripture is very instrumental in grasping how to interpret the scripture. So the sum total of the word is truth. So we're seeing, yes, even if one of God's saints dies, it is precious to him. But at the same time, he takes no pleasure in the fact that they die. You see the difference there? I can, it can be precious to me, but it doesn't mean I want it. And that's because God said so. Not because I think he's thinking wrong. He said it, so now I'm changing my thinking to match what the whole of Scripture says, if that makes sense, hopefully. So God can view the death of one of his saints as precious, yep. Yeah. At the same time, take no pleasure in the fact that they died because he says, I take no pleasure in the death of one who dies. Said that. It is an absolute fact that if you die as a Christian, you will be with God and that is great. However, God, however, can God take no pleasure in that death? If the answer is yes, then we have a lot more questions to ask God. And if you take no pleasure in it, then why do you keep letting it happen? So the scriptures take it a step further. God takes no pleasure in anyone who dies, including the wicked. I can hear God shouting, I was framed. The most troubling part of this investigation for me is the statements of the witnesses and the onlookers. In the same breath, they will say that God is so good, or he is the friend that sticks closer than the brother. But then they'll say, this good God causes tornadoes, poverty, suffering. And then my first thought is, with friends like that, who needs enemies? Now, I know what you're thinking. That's blasphemous. But I'm just being human and real at this point. These are my thoughts. These are my feelings. And I don't think God is like that. So let's get back to business. Some crime scenes can be overwhelming. And any good detective needs to slow down and gather the evidence. The evidence we will always use is the Bible. So let us take a look at some scriptures in hopes to find patterns and trends to either dispel or confirm these accusations. I will lay out some scriptures and highlight some key words and phrases. I would then point out the important clues. End of chapter one. So my lovely wife is off screen as she was listening to our conversation. She said to herself, I have some questions for you, Mr. Doug. I said, fire away. What do you have for me? Well, here's a question that I think people may have, especially people who have read some of the Bible. Does the Bible use the word omnipotent? Ooh. <laughs> Just a question. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, God, do you, they do, the Bible does use the word all-powerful, the mighty one, the king of kings, the God most high, and, and gives great descriptions of God weighing mountains in his hand and God knowing the numbers of our hair, of our head. All these things gives you that the fact that God is all powerful, he created the universes, created the worlds, that his word was powerful and is sustaining everything that exists to this day. So, yes. 
Your introduction is great, Doug. You say that, but thank you. My question is, were there any events in your life or a Bible study that you did yourself that made you just start asking these questions, these hard questions? Uh, yes. Yes.